All right, we're going to be having some fun with the Google Finance function, and we're going to use it to be pulling stock data into this spreadsheet. So these are three attributes that we're going to look at for these four stocks. And all of these attributes are for current data. All right, so that will mean more later, but we'll just start out by typing Google Finance, and we'll take a little bit to talk about how this function works. So the purpose of the function is to import security data and we'll bring them into Google Sheets from Google Finance. So Google Finance is a separate service. It does not run inside of Google Sheets. So the Google Finance function creates a connection between the two. So we'll look at the syntax here. The first thing that you do, as always with the formula, is you type out an equal sign, and then you'll type Google Finance. And when you look at these different arguments that the function can take, the square brackets indicate that they're optional, so the only argument that you really need is ticker symbol. And when you specify the ticker symbol, here, let's go back to the spreadsheet for a little bit. And we're going to be looking up General Electric. So the ticker symbol for that is just GE. And you could just type GE. But to be more accurate in case there's a GE on another stock exchange, you really want to pre-pin the ticker symbol with the name of the stock exchange. So we're going to say NYSE and then a colon and then GE. And we're just going to do that by referencing A2. We already have it in here. Uh, we'll close this off. And because the other arguments are optional, that's all you need. It pulls in the current price. So when you start using the Google Finance function, you'll notice at the bottom that it's telling you that these quotes will be delayed up to 20 minutes. This I've never seen this warning down here until I've used a Google Finance function. So that just kind of pops up and let you know, hey, these aren't actually real time. Now, since we want to do it for all four of these stocks, I put them in the column here in A2, so I could just drag this formula down, but we'll do one thing before we drag it down, and that is we'll put a dollar sign before the A, and that fixes the column reference, so later when we drag this to the right, it'll always stay in column A. But I'll select B2, I'll drag this down, and now we've looked up the current price for all four of these stocks. So we're using price as the first attribute, but the earnings are really important for a stock, right? So just the stock price doesn't tell us very much. Let's look at the price to earnings ratio of these stocks. So we're going to do that by, uh, we'll just drag the formula in B2 over to C2, and then we're going to append it. So it's still looking up the current price, so when we use a comma, now we can specify the attribute that we want to look up. Let's look at our function information here again. So the first optional argument is attribute. And we'll take a quick look at the Sheets Help website. Scroll down, and there's all different types of attributes. We just did price. You don't have to specify that. That's the default. Now we're going to do PE, which is the price to earnings ratio. And then we'll do beta, which is the beta value. It's a measure of the risk. So let's go back to the stock analyzer. And for the attribute, we're going to point it to C1. But in this case, we're going to fix the row reference. So we'll put a dollar sign before that. We'll hit enter and I'll explain to you why we put that dollar sign in. But first you'll notice that there's an error coming back as a result. And that's because GE hasn't had earnings recently. So you can't calculate a price to earnings ratio if there's no earnings, small detail. But if we come into C2, that one has an error. But if we drag it down, we know there's earnings for these other three stocks. And so they do have a price to earnings ratio. So because this is talking about price, it's actually the lower the price to earnings ratio, the better. So you're looking at buying cheaper earnings if you are going to buy U.S. Steel as opposed to more expensive earnings if you're buying PPG. But let's talk about how these cell references work. So we'll go back up to C2 and we'll look at this formula and we'll talk about the placement of these dollar signs. So as we briefly mentioned before, these cell references, so here we have A2, have a dollar sign incorporated into them. So we're going to talk about A2 here where the dollar sign is before the column letter. So what that does is when we copy this formula from B2, 
where it had a dollar sign A2. We copy it to C2 and the A doesn't change. So if there was no dollar sign, this would point to B2, but you don't want to use this cell as your ticker symbol because there's no ticker symbol there. So we fixed it with A2, but we did not fix the row number and I'll show you why. So when we uh, want to look up the price to earnings for General Electric, this comes through as A2, but when you drag it down, it allows the row number to shift. So this PE ratio belongs to Microsoft because we allowed the row number to shift down to three. And now when we're looking at the attributes, we want to pick up the price to earnings ratio for all four of these formulas in column C. So let's put a comma over here and we're using C, let's underline it, C dollar sign one. Because we don't want the row number to change. So this uh, next row will show C and the column is not shifting because we're going down, not to the left or right. But the row number will also stay the same because of the dollar sign. So this will always be C1 for the attribute, but for the ticker symbol, it's going to update on every row. So if you had a really long list, you would use these dollar signs to fix it, to enable the copy and pasting and have your formulas still work. All right, let's go back to the spreadsheet and watch those dollar signs help us again. So when we take this formula and we move it over to the right for beta, that's going to stay on row one for GE, but shift to column D to pick up the beta. All right, we'll hit escape. So we haven't modified this formula at all with our keyboard to get over to beta copied it to the right and we copied it down and it did all the work for us. So if we're looking at beta, let's talk about beta for a second. So beta will measure a stock's volatility compared to the market. So if it's, let's say in the S&P &S 500, it will compare how that stock's fluctuations correlate with the fluctuations of the S&P 500. So what this doesn't do though, is indicate that the current price is a good value. So that's why we'll look at the price to earnings ratio and the beta because they're both different considerations. All right, let's go back to the stock tracker. So these data points, they'll help us to make a decision on which stock to buy, right? But it's probably best to not graph these. We'll get into some other data in a minute that makes for a better graph. We'll keep this as a table. It's meaningful as a table, but we'll get into a graph and some other visualizations here in a minute. And what we're going to do it with is historical stock data. All right, so we just did current stock data. And we'll look at the Google Finance function again. And all of these attributes are available for current data. But if you go down to historical data, really all they have here is different versions of stock price. Open, close, high, low. You can get the volume as well, but that's not going to come into our analysis. So what we will do is we'll get the closing price at the end of a year for the last four years. So we'll scroll down a little bit here just to get a clean slate. And we'll build out this table similar to the last one in that we're going to build some headers that are useful to use as cell references. So we'll do the end of the last couple of years here. We'll go up and grab the same stocks And then we'll build our formula. So we're going to say Google Finance. Grab the ticker symbol. So we still have those in column A. So we'll say A12 there. We'll fix the A, right? So when we drag it to the right, it won't move, but it's okay if the row number moves. So we'll fix that A. And then the attribute, we said we want the closing price. So before we put the attributes in a cell and we reference them, but you can also just type them in. So we'll say close. And then when you're using historical data, it needs a date. Okay, so uh, let's just give this a start date as our only input and we'll grab that from cell B11 in this case. And we will fix the row number because we always want it to grab row 11. So we'll fix that with the dollar sign. We'll end the formula. 
And what happens here is that when it's grabbing historical data, the function tries to be helpful and it outputs an array of at least four cells in this case. So it gave us two header cells. So it told us a date and then it gave us a header to say this is the closing price. Well, that may be well and good depending on how you're using it, but we just want one cell of data. So what we'll do, we will come back up into here and we will use the index function. So the index function, we'll take a minute to talk about that. All right, so the index function, what it does is it retrieves a value from a specific cell within a range or array of cells. So what that means in this case is that we want to reference that array that just output the four cells and we're going to ask for the second row in the second column. Now, one thing to know about the index function is that so the row is the row number within the reference, not the row number of the sheet. So if it's in row 15, but it's really just the second row in the reference, you'll specify a two and we'll take a look at what that means. And so what we had just talked about is we will take row two, column two, because that's where the stock price was. We'll close that off and there's our formula. So we'll drag that down to get all of these closing prices for that date. And because we use the fixed cell references correctly, we can just drag it to the right two and it all fills in. Now these are stock prices, but stock prices in themselves are not that useful, right? If you have X dollars, you just divide it by the share price and all that tells you is how many shares you can buy. But what can be helpful is the change in share price over the years. So we're going to add some columns in to do that. And we're going to make some space for columns that show the change in value. Right, and then we're going to add in some headers. We'll say the percentage change from 19 to 20. We'll take that header, post it here, and then just update the typing on it. Do some light formatting. And then we're going to input a formula that just calculates the percentage change. So this will be the current year, which is in C12, minus the previous year, and then that difference divided by the previous year. Okay, we'll format that as a percentage, and then we'll just drag that formula down. All right, so those percentages are done. I'll make a few modifications to get the cell references right. But the same basic theory is going on here. So this really isn't a Google Finance function. This is just some relatively basic math. We'll drag that down. And now we're going to get rid of the actual prices because all we want to work with here is the fluctuations. And we want to copy and paste values. Copy, paste, special. And then we will delete these cells and we're not going to delete rows or columns because we don't want to do any collateral damage above us or to the side. So we'll just delete the cells, shift left. And the percentages are staying in there because we made them just values. Shift left. And we'll delete this and shift it to left. All right, now we have some useful historical data here. And this is showing us useful data, but it is a little bit hard to read. So we are going to visualize this data. It's going to lend itself to being visualized a little bit better because it's all the same unit. So this is all just percentage change. When we were doing the current stock data, we had an error in there and then we had three different types of measurement. This has a lot less noise. So what we'll do first is we'll throw it into a quick chart and then we'll do some fun custom formatting after that and you can choose which way you like better. Let me know in the comments which one you like, but this one, this one's really easy. So what I did first, if you notice, I highlighted the range that we want to visualize. Come down to the right, and we're going to use this lonely, sometimes forgotten, explore button. We'll click on it, and what it does, it just tries to read your mind, right? So it tries to tell you about the data and what we're looking for is to visualize the change. So actually none of these are what I was expecting. 
So what I'll do is I'll go back, I'll highlight that range, but then I'll grab the headers too. Maybe we'll have better luck with that. We'll go back over to the right, scroll down. And these are closer. I'll grab this one, pull it in, decrease it a little bit. And I will click on these three dots. So a lot of times when I've used the Explorer button in the past, it actually has guessed a little bit better. But this one's probably not quite as far off as it looks. If you go down and you just put a check mark and switch rows and columns, it'll show us what we want. So let's drag this to the left a little bit to see all of the labels better. And this is accomplishing what we want because we can see the stocks that grew more, right, are above. So, so none of them did very well from 21 to 22, but the best one in 20 to 21 is Microsoft. And the flattest stock on here is General Electric. All right, so that chart is helpful. We'll leave that there. Thanks, Explore button. We'll close you now. And we'll do uh, one last thing, and I think it's kind of an original uh, way to use numbers in a spreadsheet. You can see illustrations like this possibly, I don't know, maybe if you read The Economist or The Wall Street Journal, but uh, it's a little bit trickier to get it into here. All right, so let's move this chart just to clean up what we're looking at. I'll just drag it up here, make it smaller, scroll back down, and now we just can concentrate on what we're doing this time. So this will be custom number formatting. So we'll go up to format, but the trick is to go down and say custom number format. So when you click on that, you get this dialog box and what is happening here uh, we'll go down a little bit. I've already goofed around with some of these. That's why these finger symbols are in here. We'll just go down to this second one. It's actually the one I want because I made it before. But what this is doing is this is the formatting for, this is formatting for when it's positive. Then you put a semicolon, the negative, and then a semicolon, and then when it's zero. Right, so to decode this, you can write the name of the color in brackets. So we'll do green for positive, right? Because that's going up. Red for negative, because it's bad. And then black, which is kind of a neutral color if it's zero. Now, if we click apply here, you'll see, really I think what makes this stand out from other types of formatting is the triangles. And you typically can't get special characters like that in Google Sheets. I'll show you what I did. If we'll go into cell C17 and I've installed an add-on called insert special characters. So you wouldn't have it in your Google sheets, but if you want it, go to get add-ons. We'll go there right now. And if you search for insert special characters, it's this one right here by sheets help. So that's a sister website that I run. So this is a, an add-on that I had created from yours truly. And let's start it up. When you click open, you get a sidebar on the right. And let's search for arrows. You can use all of these, but what I actually ended up doing is just using a triangle. Search for that. And let's insert the up triangle. Go to a different cell and insert a downward facing triangle. So you can color these before they go in or change the font size. But since these are in the ending up in that custom formatting window, you don't have to do that. So you will copy it from there. So you can copy that, put it on the clipboard. Let's go back to custom number format. And that's where these came from. So you would just paste it right in there. So now that we've applied that custom number formatting, you can easily look at this, see what's positive and see what's negative. And you see the only one that went up for three years is US Steel. So on the subject of formatting, a lot of times what's trickiest to get formatted correctly in a spreadsheet is a date. In this next video, we explore dates and times by using every single date and time function available in Google Sheets in one spreadsheet. I don't know, thought it sounded like fun. Check out the video and let me know what you think. See you in that video. Thanks for watching. It's good to have you around.